So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the face of a monster. In fact, in his home country of Belgium, where this story takes place, he is widely known as Le Monstre or as the Beast of Belgium for the actions that he committed. In these multiple homes between 1992 and 1996, where Marc Dutroux converted his cellars into what we would come to know as the House of Horrors. Reporters who covered the case as it unfolded, said that it was the most disturbing story they had ever heard of and that it was completely insane and that even Hollywood itself could never write a script as crazy as what happened. In addition to all of this, the police in Belgium and the entire investigation was so poorly done, it was so botched that police reform had to take place and even the king of Belgium himself had to get involved. And if that wasn't enough to make you wonder about what atrocities were committed in today's story, this just might. About a third of Belgians who had the last name as Marc Dutroux went and had it changed because essentially his name had become synonymous with evil. All right, guys, let's get into today's story. Now, quickly before we get into it, hi, my name is Ashley and I like to talk about crime creeping, unbelievable stories. If you guys are new here, welcome to my channel. And if you guys are recurring subscribers, thank you so much for supporting me. And if you guys enjoyed today's video, don't forget to comment, like, subscribe. All of it really does help. And if you want more crime creepy content, check out my TikTok. The link is in my description box below. All right, so let's get into the story. Now, we're going back in time a little bit, and this story actually takes us to August 9th, 1996, when 14-year-old Leticia Delhez vanished after leaving a local swimming pool in Bertrix, Luxembourg. As she was exiting the building, she was abducted and forced into this perpetrator's vehicle. Luckily, though, there were several witnesses that saw the whole thing happen, and they ended up testifying that it was a white van driven by an unidentified white male. The witnesses were also able to get a portion of the license plate, which was enough to give police an identity on who the van belonged to, which ended up being a man named Mark Dutroux. It was no surprise to police when they first heard this name. He had been known to the police and he was in the system for a very long time, specifically for SAing many women in the past. With that formation in hand, police knew they were dealing with a very dangerous man who was now escalating his very criminal behavior. On the 13th of August, 1996, police raided several of the homes belonging to Mark, but they also arrested him and they made three additional arrests as well. In addition to Mark being arrested was also his wife at the time named Michelle Martin, an accomplice of his named Michelle Lelievre, and a business associate of Mark's named Jean-Michel Nihoul. All four were brought into the police station, but it did not take very long for Marc Dutroux to start talking. Almost right away, Marc ends up blaming Jean-Michel for absolutely everything. At the time of his arrest, it was already known to many people that Jean-Michel had a very high network of higher ups that ranged from police officers to businessmen and politicians. Police would end up believing that Jean-Michel was actually the brains behind this entire operation that we'll get into in this video, and that the schemes and the actual actions were carried out by Marc Dutroux. Essentially, Jean-Michel was the boss, allegedly coordinating for girls to be sent to a variety of older, disgusting men in business and politics. Two days later, on August 15th, Mark tells the police something absolutely shocking. He says, I'm going to give you two girls, which was surprising to police. After all, all they knew at this point is that they were looking for one girl in particular, and that was Leticia. In addition to that, the house raids that they had performed a few days prior turned up absolutely nothing. Going back to the interrogation with Mark, he tells them that he does have Leticia, but that he also has another girl named Sabine Darden. 
So Sabine had actually gone missing in May of that year on her way to school, and she was just 12 years old. There were extensive searches done for Sabine, but by August, her case had gone cold until Mark told the police exactly where she was. He tells police that both of the girls are being kept as prisoners in his makeshift dungeon he created within one of his homes. Sabine had been kept captive for about 80 days at that point, and Leticia had only been kept captive for six days. And thankfully, both of them were still alive. But little did police know at the time that this investigation and discovery was going to open a whole other can of worms. But to understand all of that, we have to rewind a little bit. So in 1995, two eight-year-old girls who also happened to be best friends vanished without a trace while they were outside playing. Their names were Julie Lelon and Melissa Russo. They were last seen walking hand in hand, going outside promising both of their parents that they would be back within 30 minutes. And sadly, that was the last time they were ever seen alive. There was a worldwide search done for these girls. Melissa's father, Gino Russo, led the international hunt. He searched across Italy, Spain, Morocco, Brazil, and even Canada for his daughter, but she was nowhere to be found. Over 10,000 posters were distributed for the missing girls, and the family was actually met with some very shocking reactions from the police. Although Belgium, it is a small country in Europe, it's not immune to crime. But many people at the time in Belgium, especially in the early 90s, were adamant that something like this was just not possible in the small country of theirs. The girls must have been taken elsewhere is what most of the people were thinking. But that wasn't it. Police also gave the parents of the girls a very hard time and they were dismissed and told that their children were likely runaways and to come back at a later date if the girls did not return. It was widely believed that because crime was so low in Belgium at the time, that things of this nature were not possible in their country and that although this would be considered extremely racist and disgusting at any point in history, many of those believed that such crimes involving young children belong to places like Southeast Asia, but definitely not Belgium. Which is incredibly shocking to me because I came across another article from the Irish Times that stated that between 1990 and 1996, 15 children had gone missing in Belgium with seven of them turning up deceased. A few days after the two girls had disappeared, Gino Russo actually claimed that three witnesses came forward saying that it was Mark Dutroux who was responsible And apparently police were watching him. He was on their radar, but absolutely nothing was done to investigate him early on. A couple months later, on August 23rd, 1995, two teenage girls were on their way home after a night out. It was the early hours of the morning when 17-year-old Anne Marshall and 19-year-old Effie Lambrecht were on holiday in West End near the Belgian coast. They were also with several of their friends. Apparently, they were going out on holidays, vacationing, just having fun with a bunch of friends. On the evening of the 22nd, they had gone to see an entertainment show at a local nightclub. And by the time it was over, they had managed to catch the last train back. However, the train only took them to a certain point. Unfortunately, it did not take them all the way home. So they got off at the last stop of the train and essentially after that, they were forced to hitchhike approximately 13 kilometers to get home. And remember, this was way before the time of cell phones and even Ubers. Unfortunately, neither of the girls ever made it home. And on top of that, the way the police departments were set up across Belgium is that they were pretty split up to specific areas. And there was a huge lack of communication that resulted in zero lane being made between the disappearances of Julie and Melissa and those of the ones that just happened to Anne and Effie. So like I said earlier, around the same time, police had a small inkling that they had a suspect in mind that was Mark, but they didn't really do much about it. 
So at the same time, police did have an inkling, but they ignored their main suspect, who was Mark Dutroux. But I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, well, who is this guy? What do we know about him? So to get into his story a little bit, we have to go even further back in time. So according to Mark himself, he said he had a very unstable childhood with his father being described as unstable and his mother as calculating and devious. As a child, they were living in what was then known as the Belgian Congo, which would later become known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Eventually, the family would relocate to a place called Charleroi in the south of Belgium, which was known to be a much more industrial area. In 1971, his parents ended up divorcing, and with that, his mother ended up beginning a relationship with a man much younger than her, who happened to be a student and was only one year older than Mark himself, which meant that Mark would have been 15 at that point, which then meant that the other guy his mom was now seeing would have been only 16. It's not clear if this is actually 100% true because this came from Mark's own words or if anything did happen at all with that entire situation. Teachers of Mark would go on to say that he was quite a troubled and disruptive child. He was often kicked out of school and the reason for this was actually very disturbing. He was caught selling very inappropriate images to other children in his school. In 1976, when Mark was 19, he managed to get married, but that obviously was quite short-lived, even though the marriage did result in two children. After the divorce, his ex-wife was able to successfully maintain full custody of both of the children. In the early 80s, though, Mark started pushing his luck. He wanted to see how far he could get with women. And he was also known for committing petty crimes at the time, but he just really wanted to see how far he could get. There was a local skating rink in his area that he would visit quite often. And while he was there, he would quote unquote accidentally bump into women in order to touch them inappropriately. Eventually, people caught on to what he was doing because there's absolutely no way you can bump into that many people so often, especially when you start bumping into the same person over and over again. And eventually, he was banned from the skating rink after he got into an altercation with the boyfriend of one of the women he kept bumping into over and over again. Then in 1988, Mark was arrested for five counts of SA along with his girlfriend, Michelle Martin. And in 1989, he was sentenced to 13 years in prison while she shockingly only received a four-year sentence. It was revealed that the pair had actually worked together to lure girls in and capture them and then violate them repeatedly. However, none of these girls, thankfully, had their lives taken away from them. In 1992, he was released from prison very early after only serving three years for good behavior. And at some point, Michelle was released as well, and both of them ended up reuniting outside of prison. We would later find out from inmates that spent time with Mark that he told them that his ultimate dream was to build a secret basement in his home that he would call an underground city where he would live with all of these young girls. And basically to him, it was like building a utopian fantasy where he would be the one and only king. If that wasn't alarming enough, his psychiatrist in prison fought really hard against his early release. He greatly believed that Mark was still a danger to society, and so did his own mother. She would show up to the parole board meetings, essentially begging the justice system to not let out her son because she knew that he was a dangerous man. But They didn't listen, and this would end up being a huge mistake. At some point after his release, although it's not exactly clear when, Mark and Michelle would end up getting married, and they even had three children together, and they were all living in the same house where one of the dungeons was. During his time out of prison, Mark, by some mysterious circumstance, was able to accumulate many properties. In total, he owned seven houses and three of them were used to commit the most heinous of his crimes. 
This was a puzzle though. It was very confusing because Mark barely had a job. He was barely able to keep one. He was also collecting money from public assistance, which totaled about $1,200 while owning these homes. And even though he was able to somehow get these homes, his monthly allowance from the government was never reduced. It was initially believed that Mark used the valuables and whatever cash he had stolen from his days of petty crimes to buy these properties. But there is speculation on this that we'll come back to a little bit later. So from here, it would take police several years to catch on to Mark. On December 13th, 1995, police arrested him for vehicle theft. And since he was under suspicion for being involved in other crimes of the children, police took this as an opportunity to search one of his homes in a neighborhood called Marcinel. As police were looking through the home, one of the police officers heard a faint scream of a child. They searched and searched, but they could not find the source. So it was assumed that the screams were coming from outside and were thought to be probably just children playing outside somewhere nearby. However, there was a locksmith that was tagged along with a police officer. And while they were searching the home, they too heard the screams of the child and they were absolutely adamant that they were coming within the home. Of course, he raised his concerns to the police officer and told him then and there, and he was met with a very dismissive reply. The police officer says, who is the police officer here? You or me? However, prior to leaving the home, police did notice that Mark had several security cameras set up, which they found to be a little bit odd, so they decided to take those with them. But because the police did not have the right technology to get into the camera or to properly watch it or they didn't understand how to use these things, the footage remained completely unwatched and soon enough it was returned back to Mark without the police having ever looked at them. And had they taken the time to properly assess this evidence, they would have discovered everything a lot sooner and lives would have been spared. This was a terrible mistake by police that would have awful consequences, but eventually Mark was released just four months later. It wasn't until the following year when Mark was arrested again for Leticia that police discovered what had truly happened, which takes us back to that day in the interrogation room on August 13th. So after he goes on to tell the police about Leticia and Sabine, he takes them to the house himself to show him exactly where the two girls were placed. In these stills, you can see the two young girls being freed from their prison, followed by Mark covered in a green army blanket. Once the girls were safe, Sabine, oddly enough, thanked Mark for letting her go, which struck everyone as quite weird. It would turn out that during her three-month captivity, Mark had essentially brainwashed her into thinking that he was actually the one protecting her from evil people outside. So essentially, young Sabine was suffering from Stockholm Syndrome at this point. Once the police were able to talk to both of the girls, they both had awful stories to share with them. Since Sabine had been held in captivity for much longer than Leticia, she had suffered much worse. She had been starved, she had been abused, she had been essayed over and over again. And in an interview she gave with 60 Minutes, she detailed how Mark referred to her as a wife and that they were meant to be together. Leticia, on the other hand, also said that she had been essayed but that she had been chained to a bed in order for Mark to do whatever he wanted to do to her, but that he had also filmed everything for his own sick pleasure. Meanwhile, at one of his other homes in an area known as Sars La Boussière, police made another horrifying discovery. It was the dungeon where Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo had been captive. Unfortunately, both of the girls had passed away due to starvation, not really knowing how close they were to actually being saved. So to rewind a little bit, remember when I said the police officer and the locksmith heard those faint screams coming from somewhere in the basement area or possibly even outside? Well, 
it turns out that those screams were very much real and they were the screams of both Julie and Melissa that were being held captive in one of the dungeons in the cellar. The girls had been kept captive there for approximately seven months and the reason that the police didn't see it right away when they were down there the first time was because it was hidden behind a shelf on a wall and it was quite a small room. It measured approximately three feet wide and I'll put some pictures here for you guys to see what kind of conditions these two little girls were forced to live in. Here is where the two girls would spend their days and nights in complete darkness. There were a few times where Mark would take them out to another room, but it would just be to hurt the girls even more. He would chain them to a bed only to violate them over and over again. He would record it and of course he would also take photos, but he wasn't the only one. His wife Michelle would also sometimes participate and even record these disgusting events. Another sadistic thing that Mark would do to these poor little girls was that he would encourage them to write letters to their families and he would tell them that he would send it to them, but of course he never would. He would simply read them to himself, I guess it gave him a good laugh or something, and then he would keep them hidden. Some of these letters were later on read out in court and a few of them Sabine had written to her family begging them to take her home and promising that she would be a better daughter. All of this because Mark had essentially brainwashed her into believing that her parents didn't want her anymore and that they refused to pay the ransom for her in order to bring her home safely. So when Mark had been arrested for car theft and was away for four months in jail, he had apparently instructed his wife Michelle to feed the two girls in the basement while he was away. But according to her, she could not bear the thought of looking at the girls, so essentially she just left them there to starve. When Mark was released from prison, he returned home and apparently he said that he found the two girls still alive, but barely clinging to it. He attempted to save them by feeding them with baby bottles and trying to give them all of these vitamins and minerals, but it was way too late because both of the girls had passed away and he even claimed that one of them passed away in his arms. He then took their lifeless bodies and buried them in the garden of a different property. As a side note though, this is heavily debated by the parents of the two girls just out of common sense. So how could possibly two girls survive four months without having any food or water? Generally speaking, an adult could possibly survive two to three months with water alone. But when it comes to just food, that gets reduced to basically half. With only food, you could survive about one to two months. But if you have neither, you're going to pass away a lot quicker than that. What's even more disturbing is that Melissa had been violated multiple times in the weeks before she passed away. So if Mark was in prison at the time, who else was doing this to this little girl? The answers remained completely ambiguous, but we'll get into a few theories later on. But Mark wasn't done confessing just yet. He then tells the police that there are two additional bodies buried in the same place, and those were of Anne and Effie. When police arrived to the location, they ended up digging up the two girls, and it was discovered that they had actually been sedated and moved there where they had been buried. Both of the girls had been wrapped in plastic and were essentially still alive when they were buried. So during the time the two girls had been kept in captivity, they had been chained and held in this makeshift dungeon, treated absolutely horribly, violated over and over again, and of course it was all being filmed. But shockingly and disturbingly, that was not the only discovery that police made when they were digging up that garden. They ended up discovering a third person. It was a man named Bernard Weinstein. He was a former accomplices of Mark's who he had offed and buried over a argument. Apparently, Bernard had failed to feed the girls while Mark was away, which led to an altercation. And in his confession, he would detail how he would brutally torture Bernard before drugging him and then burying him alive. 
Towards the end of his confession, Mark admitted that he had not acted alone. He had also incriminated his wife, his other accomplice, Michel Lelievre, as the van driver, and of course, Jean-Michel Nehul. But he also claimed that he was just one man, almost like a pawn, out of something much, much bigger. Mark claimed that he was part of a huge child ring, if you know what I'm talking about, that included successful businessmen, high-ranking government officials, and policemen. This claim sparked thought on how Mark was able to afford so many properties, which led people to wonder whether or not he was actually being funded by these successful business people in order for him to capture people or children for their own benefit. This was further backed up when police looked into his past victims, and one of them was named Regina Loof. She confirmed that she had been taken to these parties where there was a bunch of illegal activity going on with much older and wealthier men, and she confirmed that both Marc and Jean-Michel were in attendance, and all this happened when she was just 12 years old. During the investigation, there were several other witnesses that would come forward as something called the X-Files, all of whom were victims of Mark Dutru and these illegal parties. And they were allowed to remain anonymous and instead of having their names presented, they were basically just given an X number name instead. Many of them had horrifying stories. For example, one of the children claimed that they had been released out into the woods and then chased by Dobermans. Many incriminated other high-ranking authority figures and even well-known people in the area at the time, but for legal reasons, I will not get into those names. But if you are curious enough, they are available online. But to make you think twice here about the investigation, police apparently did gather DNA from the dungeons that resulted in 26 samples being collected, but the results came back as inconclusive as to who they belonged to. They had also collected hair samples that were found in the dungeons, but because there was no technically concrete evidence that anyone else had entered that area besides the girls and Mark and possibly Michelle, those hairs were never tested. So make of that what you will. However, when police asked Sabine what she had seen during her captivity, she claimed that she had never seen anyone besides Mark the entire time. Now, this is where it gets even more messed up, if that's even possible. As the investigation continued, over 20 witnesses of this alleged ring said that they would testify in court these people started going missing or they would turn up deceased. Many of the officers on the case were suddenly taken off of it and even an investigating judge that was overseeing the entire investigation was removed, which led the public to believe that there was a mass cover-up going on. Specifically, in October of 1996, Judge Jean-Marc Connerot, who was actually the one responsible for issuing the arrest of Marc Dutroux, was removed from the investigation because he had attended a fundraiser event for the victims of the families. This led many people to believe that he was actually quite biased in his judgment, and then he was removed. As a result of this, he had to go absolutely everywhere with armed security because he was constantly getting threats and the police had informed him that there were actually contracts that had been taken out on him and the prosecutors on the case. The judge was so fed up with the amount of corruption and difficulty he was facing with this that he took it upon himself to write a letter to King Albert II of Belgium. This is what that letter said. This institution seems to acquire its authority and supremacy over sectors of the justice system by relying on a complex and secret modus operandi that the appropriation of certain key circuits of our institutions created and regulated by the law. It is a matter of essentially political, financial, police, and media circuits. This mafia-style criminal phenomenon is evidently not peculiar to Belgium, but it involves particular manifestations that are well-situated to this small country. 
we can imagine the obstacles that a judiciary inquiry will meet when investigating such facts, numerous taboos, problems of mentality, and the lack of cultural reference on the issue in order to be able to become aware of our deal with such criminal phenomenon, taking advantage of Belgium, of official retinence in terms of their acknowledgement, which favors or supports their occultation. The function of a criminal system of this sort is obviously to serve its fundamental purpose, the pursuance of particularly profitable illicit activities such as money laundering, and to protect the legitimacy of its activities and the impunity of its agents. This indispensable function corresponds to the motive of criminal protection that asserts the permanency of the incriminated system by means of the infiltration of certain circuits of our institutions, especially the police force, a veritable knot which my whole investigation has come up against. His letter resulted in the king stepping in to ease the rising tensions in the country and also to comfort the parents of the victims by setting up several forums to combat these sort of crimes. Soon after Judge Conerot was removed, the public was completely outraged and rightfully so. They ended up holding what they called a white march, which consisted of 300,000 people participating in protests and a march across Brussels. Citizens across the country completely lost faith in the Belgian justice system at this point, accusing the courts of covering up this entire investigation. As a result of this, the Belgian parliament was actually very fearful that a revolution was imminent. And so to avoid this, they had to set up an independent investigation into the case of Marc Dutroux. Shockingly, the investigation revealed some very disturbing and disappointing negligence in the investigation. So, like I said earlier, police did know about Mark Dutroux. He was on their radar. They had a record of people coming forward implicating him in the cases of the missing children. And they also did actually hear about his wishes to build this very strange city underground. It was through this independent investigation that it was actually revealed that the police had never gone through those tapes they had collected from Mark's home. Had they actually taken the time to do their jobs and go through the videotapes, they would have been able to discover the girls still alive. And it was also through this investigation that they discovered that the police officer that was there that particular day that had heard the children screaming, he didn't do what he was supposed to do in order to look throughout the house as thoroughly as he should have. Additionally, Regina Loof was classified as a pathological liar and all her testimony was deemed as worthless. But to this day, she is adamant that she was telling the truth the whole time, that it would have been much easier for the authorities to label her as quote unquote crazy than to actually look into the truth, which judging by the way they handled the entire case, I'm not surprised if the police were actually just labeling her as some crazy person and in order to ignore her claims. Sadly, it was decided that Dutroux's case did benefit from some corruption, carelessness, and lack of professionalism, but there was no evidence that he received help in the form of a cover-up from higher-ranking people. And if that wasn't enough to make you extremely upset about this entire thing, Jean-Michel Nehul was actually released after five months. It took a very long time, but there was finally a trial in 2004, and thankfully there was very little room for Mark to run. It took 56 trial days for each side to present their cases, but by the end of it, it was pretty clear. The jury found Mark guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. As for his wife, Michelle, she was given a sentence of 30 years. His accomplice, Michelle, was given 25 years as well. As for Jean-Michel Nehul, he was given five years, but unfortunately, there was just not enough evidence to prove that he was the mastermind behind this entire operation. Instead, he was found guilty of participating in trafficking of illegal substances. 
In 2012, Mark's wife, Michelle, was released on parole after just serving 16 years, while Jean-Michel Nahul passed away in 2019 due to natural causes. But there was one good thing that came from all this. Eventually, the various branches of authority in Belgium at the time were disbanded and the police reform took place, which ended up merging the police into one federal police force. This was done in order to increase the transparency and communication between everyone, but also to prevent different police forces with essentially competing with each other to see who could crack the case open first. Also, the ability to grant early release to anyone from prison was taken away from the minister and it was given to a special tribunal that was created solely for this purpose to make much more objective decisions considering that if Mark hadn't been released after just serving three years of his original sentence, none of this would have happened. Which seems to have worked because in 2013, Mark actually believed that he would be able to get released so he applied for early release but thankfully he was denied and that is the story of mark de true and the atrocities he committed in belgium in the early 90s some of his houses have been demolished while others have been boarded up and i'll put some pictures here for you guys but let me know what you guys think of the case do you think there was a cover-up going on do you think that he was just lying and implicating other people in order to alleviate the responsibility from himself if you guys have heard any other information that I didn't mention in this case, let me know because it was quite a very long and complicated case to cover. I was very surprised that there was not more up-to-date coverage on this story. I'm not sure if it's because a majority of it was in French since they do speak that in Belgium or maybe even in Flemish. The English articles I came across were mostly from the late 90s, the early and mid 2000s. So if you guys have heard anything else about this, let me know in the comments below. And if you have any other story suggestions, whether they're crime creepy and unbelievable stories, also just let me know, leave them in the comments below. All right, thank you so much for joining me, guys. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.